Hello, world. Welcome to another week of Golf Subpar with Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. Slays, what a week it was at the BMW Championship. Arguably the most exciting PGA Tour event of the year with Patrick Cantlay and Bryson DeChambeau going to a six-hole playoff where Patrick Cantlay uh, kind of stole one from Bryson DeChambeau. Dude, that was fun. Like, I was looking on Twitter. I was watching this thing. People that aren't even big golfers were tweeting about this thing. I feel like the whole world was locked into this thing, and, and rightfully so. I mean, going back to even regulation, 17th hole of regulation, I thought, well, this is Bryson's. Mm -hmm. Can't lay dirt nap, water ball. It's over. Sure enough, he comes in on 18, makes a bomb to tie it, get into a playoff. And then during the playoff, I mean, there was two or three times I thought Bryson had it won. There was one time I thought Cantley had it won when Bryson drove it into the water on 18 there. I mean, it was just back and forth. You never knew what was going to happen. It was just crazy shit over and over. And yeah, like you said, I think I think Cantley stole one there. Uh, Bryson had a lot of looks and hit a lot of good putts, actually, to win that thing, but couldn't get it done. And uh, I mean, Cantley just stayed alive. But damn, I was one of those. I was like, damn, what time does it get dark? I don't want this to keep it going. We've had a ton of playoffs lately, but this one I was like, yo, let's keep this thing rolling. Well, I was a little banged up from the night before, so I was actually it hoping happens. for it to end because that was my nap time between before the Tyron Woodley and Jake Paul fight. Well, it just kept going. So I just had to get some caffeine in me and keep on rolling. But it was so exciting to watch. I mean, Patrick Cantlay's putter was the only thing hotter than the Arizona Summers right now. Yeah. That He could not miss, hooping it from everywhere. I mean, he still he hit some great shots, but he was making 20-footers. He made seven putts over 20 feet for the week. It was a joke. It was a joke. I mean, it was just like it was like video game stuff. I mean, you just line him up and hit it. I mean, he's he since they started tracking strokes, strokes gained putting in 2004, best most strokes gained ever in the history of the PJ Tour. Since then, he gained almost 15 shots on the yeah. field. Five, 537 I mean, feet of putts. That's a joke. Time. And like, I mean, when Bryson is driving it the way that he did this past week, just hitting bombs after bombs right up the middle, like you got to do something weird to beat him because he's going to be flicking wedges in every single hole. I mean, look at number one. He, every guy out there is pulling out an iron or a wood of some sort, just getting a sand wedge, lob wedge, whatever you like into that hole. And he's just sending driver up there and hitting a greenside bunker, flicking it up yeah. there and making burn. I mean, it's, it's just he's tough to you got to do something weird to beat him when he's driving like that. I've, I've talked to a lot of very high ranked PGA Tour players, and I mean, they'll tell you if he's on hitting it straight, you, you can't beat him. And you, like you said, you have to do something special like make over 500 foot of putts. That'll do it to, to get it done. But I mean, still, Bryson goes out there, shoots 27 under, you know, lowest score ever to not win a tour event. They just absolutely abused Caves Valley. And once again, shows that it doesn't matter how long you make these places, mm -hmm. if they're soft. And the fairways are decent where they can hit decently wide where they can hit driver. They're going to torch it. Soft fairways, soft greens, ball in hand on Thursday, Friday. You're going to get some low scores. I don't care if you make it 8,000 yards, whatever. It doesn't matter. I mean, shit, Bryson's hitting wedge from 186 on 17 in the, in the you know, over and over in the playoff and landing it behind the holes. Like, what? how far you got to make the holes? Like, that, that's, that's not going to do it. And like Caves Valley, not that easy of a golf course. They made it look way easier I've than it played was. it, and I damn sure didn't think it was that yeah, easy. Yeah, no, I mean, 27, you're shooting yeah. 20, and you're just not even sniffing. You're not even lapped. I mean, two guys kind of ran away from everybody else. But there's nothing you can do if you give these guys all those type of conditions. It's going to be a, I mean, it's just going to be scuba gear type yeah. stuff, and that's what they got this week. But they made it look a lot easier than it was. No one in the entire field – wasn't under par 69 players yeah. all 69 under par not one guy had a bad by the way they're playing all four days too like there's no cut so it's only the guys that were in the yeah, top some days you just pack it in just like pack your season's in. over nope four over who cares i'm done i'll get out of here nope not this week every single dude under par i mean the golf is just it's a it's a joke how good it is and right now. there was a lot more on the line than just the title at the bmw championship because with those guys as well as they've played this season patrick canley now becoming the first three-time winner on the pga tour but the winner of that playoff got the number one seed going into Eastlake, which gets a two-shot advantage. The loser gets the number three seed, which is going to be Bryson DeChambeau. He starts now three shots back, going for $15 million. I'd like to have that little two-shot cushion. Oh, yeah, it was huge for a number of reasons. One, the huge payday that you get just for being the winner of the golf tournament. And then, like you said, now you're the you're the, you're the the pole position. You know, you're the first guy out there. You get the big lead instead of starting three back. And, I mean, can't lay – I mean, what he did on the green, I don't know. Like, he says he's found his putter. It's every, you know, he's been tinkering and changing things. He, he changed his grip leading up to this week. He made it one degree open because he said he felt shut with everything. And obviously that worked. But like to replicate that again for another week, I mean, that was a special, special week on the putting green. So, um, yeah, but you got th he's I, an incredible putter, period. Yeah. But that was like beyond. Yeah, but I'm interested to hear what you think about the format because, you know, there's been a lot of tweaking of it over the years. It's hard to get it exactly right. But, but here you are, 30 of the best players in the world, and you're starting with a two-shot lead. You like it? Hate it? 
I don't know if I like it or hate. I like the fact that they've been willing to change over the years. They, they've, they've tweaked it. And it, it's tough when you're starting everybody at the same and it's like, all right, well, if Jim Furyk makes this button, this guy misses, then they flip. Fly. There's so much math and, and changing going on that as, yeah. for the average viewer, like, dude, like, I can't I can't keep up with this. Like, you know what I mean? It's easier when, hey, whoever wins the trophy is the FedEx Cup champion. And this is the way that they've done it right now. So I like that they're willing to to tweak the formula but it is tough when you're looking at the leaderboard day one if some guy that starts you know five back plus goes out and has a bad front nine like well you're done you know like my, and then half the guys can't even win the tournament they're so far back my interesting thing would be like say tony fina he wins the northern trust the first one what if he would have won last week so he wins both of them just absolutely dominates and he only gets, he two gets shot the lead. same he gets the same got, yeah there's got to be something in there for that but either way i like that coming down the last hole or whatever it is we know who's where, where we stand it's not like okay if a guy that's in 12th misses this putt then so and so wins yeah. the FedEx Cup. I like it. We got we got one trophy. Right, there's two trophies on the line, but we got one. Tr- we're gonna know exactly when that last putt hits. Who won the FedEx Cup? Yeah, 100 percent makes it way easier for everyone watching. Whoever's on the top of the leaderboard wins. That's what we're yeah. used to seeing. The thing I don't like about it is that like last or last year, Xander Schauffele shot the lowest four rounds at East Lake. That but he didn't win the golf tournament because he started too far behind. That that doesn't count as a win. You know, the winner wins. So you could start with a some guy could start eight back or whatever it is and end up losing by one. And the guy that wins maybe had the head start, and that counts as a win on his resume. Where it doesn't for you, it, I don't like the like, play official well. the official win when there's staggered scoring starting off. I think that's a little it's not an official a little win. weird. It's not official. No, the money's official. The money is the money is official, super official. But it is not an official win. I believe they do it like Xander Schauffele. That counted for world ranking points as a win. It should. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like I mean we're adding up scores here, guys. I don't care where yeah, I start. The but, guy who shoots the lowest for four days but should that, count yeah. as a win. And, but the fifteen million, hundred percent official. Yeah. I Last know. place, three hundred and ninety thousand. So it's nice to get in there. Patrick Reed sat it out. You know, he's he's recovering from um, being sick with the double pneumonia. He snuck in there at the thirtieth spot, which hey, three hundred ninety thousand for sitting at home, not too not too bad. Hopefully he's healthy and will be able to tee it up this week. But a couple guys had a chance coming down the stretch. Alex Noren, KH Lee, both make bogey on their last hole. The Seagull, Charlie Hoffman was right there. Uh, he finished 32nd. I was kind of rooting for him to finish 31st. I'll be just honest. Right there. Just a, just a shit, short a little bit. But, <laughs> Pulling for you, bud. But it's crazy. Like, he finished 32nd, and you go back, and I believe he triple bogeyed the 72nd hole at the Northern Trust. Like, it would be interesting oh. to go back and oh, yeah. see what, what if he made par. Was? Yeah. What, what Would that have been enough to get in 30? Because you know – he might be kicking himself a little bit for that one. Yeah, triple on the 72nd. That's going to cost you some points there. But you mentioned Patrick Reed. I think he's the big question mark right now. A, will he play this week at Eastlake? I don't. I haven't heard any news on that yet. But not only that, like, what's this do for him for the Ryder Cup? Like, I got to think, if you're sitting out these two and then you don't got anything else before the Ryder Cup, it's going to be hard when you're a bubble guy to pull the trigger on that. Like, how you feeling? Are you, yeah. you know, how have you been able to practice doing whatever? So, I don't know. I mean, he's Captain America. That's the nickname everyone's given him. Uh, he wants to be there more than anything, but that's a tricky spot for a guy that, I mean, in all, you know, I, I think if, if he had played and just stayed healthy the last two weeks, he'd be on that team, yeah, regardless Pat, of what he shot. And with Patrick Cantley's win, he moved to number six, so he got that last guaranteed spot. This time next week, we will know Steve Stricker's six captain's picks. I can't wait to see who it is. Like I said, Me a neither. lot depends on Patrick Reed's health. If he If he doesn't play this week... I don't think he's on the team. I lean that way, too. I just don't think you can. Like, there's going to be somebody that plays well this week that's on the bubble, and they're going to put a good showing up at East Lake. And meanwhile, Patrick hasn't played too. I mean, it's unfortunate. It's kind of out of his control. But at the end of the day, it's like you got to go with it. And I think more more interesting almost than who makes the team where Stricker makes his picks, although that's very interesting, is, all right, who are we going to parallel, parallel these guys with? Because there was a great tweet sent out today by Jamie Weir, I believe, of Sky Sports going through. All right, so let me get this straight. Uh, Brooks hates Bryson. Bryson hates Brooks. Cantlay and Bryson don't like each other. DJ and Brooks hate each other. All right, am I getting all It's like all the dynamics of the like team chemistry in the room there. And I was like, it's actually a he said, pretty Patrick valid Reed, point. Patrick Reed's healthy. He hates everyone and everyone hates <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, everyone hates him. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, what do you and, think about this idea? Let's just say Patrick Reed plays this week and he gets on the Ryder Cup team just for the sake of argument. All right, he's not the most popular dude in the locker room amongst his peers. Bryson, got a few guys that uh, he doesn't see eye to eye with. Put those two together and sure. just be like team team enemy. You know what I mean? Team bad guy. Put them both out there and just let them, let them revel in that. That would also be a good – if those guys went out there and they did that and they won multiple points, let's say, in the four ball, whatever – uh, as a, as a team and didn't lose or something like that. I mean, I think so many they get so many more fans. Maybe guys that don't like them now would turn the corner on them because they helped Team USA uh, potentially win the Ryder Cup. I, I think it could be really good for together. both of them if that happens. Yeah, and there's a lot of talk, you know, maybe putting Phil on the team to, so he can be paired with Bryson. Listen, 
you can put anyone probably but Brooks with Bryson, and I think things are going to be fine. You're telling me Dustin Johnson would be like, no, nah, bro, I, I can't play with him. No one is going to not like go to Strick and Beck, no, dude. Yeah. I can't play with I mean, him. You're going to do whatever, it take, whatever we, they ask you to we do. We know Xander and Cantley are going to play together. Correct. Justin and Jordan are going to play together. Facts. It used to be Brooks and DJ. I don't know how that situation stands right now. I feel like right they'll now. probably be splitsies. Yeah. Then you got some neutrals. You got some Switzerlands. You got your Harris English. You got your Webb Simpson, who had, you know, he took Patrick well, Reed down in Australia. Right. If he's he on takes, the team. He always takes the odd one. He's They're taken like, Bubba in the past. Mm-hmm. He's taken Patrick Reed. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I just feel like, listen, for the most part, if you if you told a guy, hey, you're going to go out with Bryson, they'd be, okay, fine, let's go do this. Yeah, dude. Especially Tell me Colin like, Morikawa couldn't handle Bryson? Exactly. And especially in, like, the best ball format, it's like, dude, hey, you go play. You're good at golf. I'm good at golf. You go play how you play. I'll go play how I play. We don't got to be best buddies at the end of the day. Just go make some tweets and let's go. It's not like you're getting married to the guy. It's freaking 18 holes. Suck it up and let's go. I'm pretty sure on, like, you know, an NFL football team, there's guys that don't like each other. 100% everywhere. It's yeah. like, what you know, figure it out. It's not that big of a thing. So, anyways, I think the pairings is where the real interesting stuff's going to come together. There'll be a few of those staple teams, like you mentioned. Then after that, it's like, all right, let's see how they go. But I hope Phil uh, is in the locker room, just as a vice captain, whatever. If you can just get him on property, get that energy in the room. I mean, every guy we've spoken to on here about the Ryder Cup things, what's your most memorable moment? Who's your favorite guy? It's like, oh, Phil. Phil took me under his wing over here at Medina or whatever. I think he's just the the best yeah, guy. We lost four of so that, that Obviously, wing, he's the curse. So yeah. <laughs> maybe we don't need him up there. But no, Phil should be involved, no doubt about it. I just I think he should be in the locker room and a, and a vice captain because Could, he's going to be a captain more. one day. Yeah, and we are going to be up at Whistling Straits. Three Sheeps. You ever heard of it? Trace, shape us, as we, they say south of the we border. We will be there getting amongst it. Hope y'all can join us. But our guest this week. So he's mm. member of a couple teams, President's Cup teams. Lucas Glover, ball striking Jesse, as they say. Ball in the striking South. Jesse. I Make love that Absolutely phrase. stripe his golf ball. Recently won the John Deere after a seven year hiatus from the victories from the winner's circle. What a great interview he was out at our place, Windyke Country Club there in Memphis. Yes, shout out Windyke. They were fantastic hosts for the week. And yeah, that, that win of the John Deere, a popular one amongst all the tour players. But also cool how he got it done with the putter, which hasn't been his best friend for a long time. Made some clutch and putts we might coming know, down the stretch. Yeah, we might May know talk why. about how that, uh, how that all started off. But dude, he's a guy that... I don't. I didn't know at all. I've never spoken to Lucas Glover, not friends with him or anything. So I was genuinely cur- curious to talk to him. I find him extremely interesting, uh, soft-spoken guy, walks off, carry a big stick type of guy. But like, I think maybe one of the more cerebral, cerebral, intellectual guys we've talked about. Big reader, really fun to talk to. I think he could go off on a range of topics. But it was cool for me just because I didn't. I didn't know him on things we'd have no idea about. Zero. We just sit there and nod, and be like, "Yep, cool, agree." You know, Clemson Tiger, sure. one of the best Clemson Tiger golfers ever, mm-hmm. got to lead the football team onto the field there at Death Valley, which we definitely get into because that's still terrifying to me. I don't understand. Seems it. Seems like a unnecessary risk. Before we get. To Lucas Glover sleeves, we got to talk about Travis Matthew, and now they've got golf gloves. Are you ready to become the unofficial sponsor of Team USA or Team Europe? With two limited edition versions of Quater's best-selling golf club, Between the Lines, you can choose where your loyalties lie. Will it be with USA and red, white, and blue glove? Yes. All right. Or with Europe and Quater's Between the Lines glove styled in blue and yellow? <laughs> uh, nope. I use it to pick up my dog's poop in the backyard. As so you it should. is a good glove. As you should. No matter which design you choose, with golf gloves from Quater by Travis Matthew, strategic seam construction helps eliminate shaft friction and reduces distractions while a grip location reminder on the palm will assist in keeping things lined up properly. Quater's golf gloves are crafted from genuine Cabretta leather and featured engineered perforations for moisture reduction and breathability. So who do you got? Show your support of your favorite team, your favorite player, or even your favorite color with Team USA and Team Europe gloves. Visit Quater.com to purchase your limited edition gloves and use the code SPP20 to get 20% off your first purchase. That's C-U-A-T-E-R.com and use the code SPP20 to get 20% off. Here's Lucas Glover on Golf Subpar. All right, we got a ball striking phenom in the house today. He is a four-time tour winner, PJ Tour vet since 2004, does it all most impressively, with no glove. Lucas Glover, what's happening? Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, thanks for Cole. being here. Yep. You got Absolutely. it. I wanna, we, we'll get into a ton. I got to talk about the no glove thing for a while. Is this? I always wanted to be a no glove guy. Couldn't even make contact with it. Is this from day one when you picked up golf, yeah. just no glove? Ne- never, ever wore one. Um, years ago, Dick Harmon in Houston, he'd cut the fingers out for me, hitting a bunch of balls when I was a kid. Um, he was uh, 
He said, well, you got to try it. Your hands are going to hurt and bleed or whatever. I said, well, you, you know, I can't really feel the club. He goes, well, if that's the case, <laughs> let's not do that when it matters. So <laughs> we, uh, we kind of stayed away from it, just never got into it. And I'm a solid 10 handicap with a glove. Really? That is incredible. Yeah. Can't I hit mean, a shot. I don't know how That's your me. contracts are, but I know my contracts were ball, shoe, and glove. Yeah. I've always said they should give me a little more up front since I don't waste any money on gloves, but yeah. I, know, I hadn't got any traction on yeah. that. Yeah. What's the – all right, so your grips, any special ta- – you got to do anything to no, keep those things just, tacky? Uh, my coop, my caddy wipes them down every morning, tournament days, but they're, I've always used full cord just, yeah, just in case. Yeah, almost have to. Yeah, yeah, just in case it gets – a, Yeah, are they – let me see those They're things. a little callousy. Oh, yeah, you got some tread on those yeah, bad boys. Yeah, some tread, a lot of balls. <laughs> I'm glad, too many. I'm glad you brought up Coop because yeah. one of my favorites yeah, oh, out yeah. on the PJ the Tour. He is a character. Tell me about the first time you met Coop. And I mean, I think y'all have one of the longest standing relationships out there. I think we, uh, I think we're third behind Jim and Fluff. Mm-hmm. Um, they were 2000-ish, and then James Edmondson and, and Ryan Palmer. They got together same year we did, but earlier in the year, uh, like 2003. We met on the what was then the Nationwide Tour, now the Corn Ferry Tour. We were in the same group, same time uh, in Omaha. And uh, I was like, man, I kind of like the way that guy works with his guy. And we kind of hit it off chatting this and that. A few weeks go by, both of us missed the cut, his guy and and me and my guy. And oddly enough, ended up at the same place shooting pool, having a few beers on a Friday evening. And uh, we just kind of hit it off and said, I got next week off. He goes, yeah, me too. I fired my guy. I said, that's weird. Me too. Let's get together. And two weeks later, uh, Eugene, Oregon was our first event. And then three weeks total we won in arizona and got our card what'd you like about when he's in the same group with you and you're like i like how this guy operates he's just straightforward and he was level and the same and and you could tell in between shots he was he'd cut up a little bit but you know there's 30 seconds every shot that matters um for a a fast player thankfully but uh (laughs) um pun intended but um and outside of that, he doesn't take himself too serious. He doesn't take me too serious. He, at the time, he didn't take his guy too serious, and, and he was he was just fun to be around and just a good just a good dude. I was talking to a buddy about him today that's known him for 14, 15 years, and that's what he said. He goes, he just you could probably have ended up with a number of good caddies, but probably not as good a dude. He's just a dude. Because you're around great. him. I mean, it's like a marriage. You're around yeah, him more yeah. than anybody. I mean, you got to like the guy. Yeah, off, for the for course. the 30 weeks, 25 to 30 weeks I play a year, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with him more than I'm with my, my family. There's yeah. no question. And um, I don't think we could have done 18 years if, if we didn't just really get along. Yeah, without question. Well, let's, go, yeah. let's go back a little bit to the, the beginning because yep. you're a, a well-put-together fella. So I actually have no idea yeah. about this, and I've known you for a long time. Did you – play other sports were you an athlete growing up yeah played everything um through about eighth grade and then kept kept the old uh i don't know how it is throughout the rest of the country but uh those that weren't good enough to play high school basketball always played for their church and when i grew up all my buddies played for the same church we had church league basketball one practice a week and then saturdays and it was eight or ten of us that were all boys in high school i did that through high school but um it came down to baseball or golf and i was a catcher uh, my grandfather was a catcher, so I kind of had some tricks of the trade from him. And when I moved up a division and uh, the, the big boys could throw curveballs, um, lost a couple between the wickets e. and uh, <laughs> got to uh, got in the car after practice. And uh, my grandfather said, well, well, what happened there? I said, I just got under my glove and I want to go to the driving range tomorrow. <laughs> so um, that was uh, that was the end of baseball. And then just just kept up the fun basketball and concentrated on golf. And I just I, I liked it the most. And I was the most I was more advanced than the other sports, even though I enjoyed them. But uh Football wasn't any good. Um, I was the center somehow. But You're the center? Yeah. Small dudes. At the I was I was short and uh, a little rounder then. And Nothing then, wrong with that. I know. Hey, <laughs> Nothing I, wrong with that. I was careful how I voiced that. Colt, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but, choose your words. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, didn't like that as much. And uh, the running thing never uh, – after practice, that never did it. So, golf, you don't have to run unless you're uh, – Running back to a tee, hitting one from out of bounds. What was your basketball game? Are you like all the other golfers that play? Just I like to spot up and shoot and and not play D. I was, uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. that's all. That's, that's, all yeah, that's all we're good at because yeah. you know, otherwise you have to run and we're not doing that. So yeah. um, I've already ruled that out. Yeah, can't score on defense. No, so what's no, no, the point no, of no, that? I, do that. I was uh, tallest on the team and played point guard. Believe it or not, mm. just for whatever reason, I could dribble and. I like to rebound, but uh, I wasn't. I wasn't very good. It was just fun, something to do. Yeah, just shoot. Well, one shoot thing a bunch you're of very good at is compressing a golf ball. Well, thank you. Mm. But tell us about this golf swing. Was this something just God-given natural talent, or 
Was it a working progress? Obviously, it worked over time, but yeah, yeah, um, both, yeah. both hand eye hand eye coordination and bat on ball, club on ball, you know, paddle sports. I could always flush it. You know, give enough time, I could hit it solid if there was a ball involved. And um, used to have, believe it or not, when I was a kid, a really really long backswing, and kind of almost loose at the top and then uh, kind of reined that in with uh, some of the, the club pros around Greenville, South Carolina where I grew up and then my grandfather took me to see Dick Harmon when I was 12 and that's kind of where it kind of where it kind of I think that's when I realized I could do this if I put my mind to it and he kind of walked me down the right path and best thing about Dick and, and the other Harmons is they're not going to change it too much they're going to take what you got and um, work with it and that's kind of what he did we got it a little shorter um, and then um, just you know he wasn't afraid to let me draw it which was good and uh, over time that's lessened but still like to work it right to left but um, solidity luckily has not been a issue the over curving it sometimes is is an issue but um, yeah it's both to answer your question that was a very long-winded way of saying both but blessed with good hand eye and and able to put the bat on the ball, club on the ball, and, and then after that it was some work. I'm very what, jealous. What do you have yeah. to work on now? Because it looks like pretty effortless, your ball it, striking. It's set up for me. It's it's set up, and um, I've got two surgically repaired knees, and I've found as I've gone around that those surgeries and looked at that, it's when I got into some bad habits. For me, they're protecting it or coming out of the rehab. So staying in my posture um, – set up first and then staying in my posture through my golf swing um, is is paramount for me to maintain the the hit the shaft lean and and the shape I want if I get out of my posture um, I don't have that don't have that real solid hit with the with the shaft lean and and I start missing it both ways which which for me is is detrimental I can't uh, I can't aim left for the right miss if I don't know if it's going over there but I think that's one thing the listeners at home could really learn a lot from is one of the best players in the world, when things get off, you immediately still go look at the setup. 100%. You don't worry about the swing. Everybody else panics about their golf swing. Like, let's just start at the beginning. Yep. It, it, it's always on the ground or from the ground uh, at our level uh, when it gets off. Um, everything, these club positions, club face, all of that, 95% of the time start from bad fundamentals. Our swings aren't going to change that much at this level, even whether you're a 23-year-old phenom or a 45-year-old guy that's been out here for 20 years. It's just not going to change that much to where it has to be a path overhaul or something because all that can be fixed on the ground. You work with Dick Harmon, who, like you said, like all the Harmon, they're not going to change. They're not going to revamp the whole thing, which I think is one of the brilliance of that family. I got to work with Billy, who's a tan yeah. of a guy, one yeah, of the yeah. best characters in yeah, the world, no by the question. way. But no have you question. ever been like, a, hey, video me, put it on the screen, let's draw some lines, or is it just all yeah. you let the ball tell you? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the ball doesn't lie, uh, as we all know. I've never been a big track man guy unless it's club test and ball test and something like that. Uh, I still don't understand spin axis and smash factor i, I, re- I really i really a lot there yeah yes yeah, it's, it's a lot and too much for me because i didn't grow up with it i understand a 25 year old that grew up with it yeah um that, that's their that's their deal that's their that's their thing um for me it, it's just it's overload but um um yeah i just i haven't been able to make that adjustment to where it matters that much i think they're brilliant for distance control brilliant for club test and brilliant for all that but um Putting lines on the screen if I'm off, yeah, for sure. See where feet are pointing, see where address is, and then what that does to the swing or what that does when it gets back to where it's supposed to be. Um, not going to overdo it with that. I always kind of say Mondays are for videoing, you know, Tuesdays are for, for, for work, and Wednesdays are for, for dialing it in, and after that, I don't want to see it. Tuesdays are for gambling. Well, yeah, I know. But <laughs> Tuesdays are for drinking. <laughs> right. Well, it's cold. You're not out anymore. I don't have anybody to play with. We used to have some good Tuesday yeah, we games. Did. Yeah, we did. But growing up, was there? did you try to model your swing, or were you a fan of anybody's swing growing up that you tried to really kind of put into your golf swing? Not really. Um, I was fortunate to have a lot of really, really good players around. Jay Haas is, lives in my hometown. I got to see Jay hit a lot of balls, and, and, and I kind of – to be honest, kind of modeled myself after how he acted more than how he swung the golf club. Uh, he's just a consummate professional. And um, as far as mirroring somebody's golf swing, it was more of a, um, I'm going to have to do this my way because mine doesn't look like a lot of people's. 
you know, that kind of short and real shallow it out at the top. And it's kind of funny now a lot of guys are trying to do that, and I'm very lucky it does it naturally. I get to the top and the hands just drop a little bit. Don't have to think about it. It's nice. Um, but to say there was one person or a type of swing I wanted, I, I didn't, and I'm very thankful that I was able to kind of do it my way is a hard way because there's so many people that have hit, hit a lot of golf balls better than me in the last 120 years. Well, but not a whole lot. But yeah, um, my way is, it, you know, list. golf's such a personal, individual sport and thing that that if you try to get into the mirror game, I think it can be, I think it can hurt you. Positions or a look or a feel is one thing. Like when I'm trying to hit a, when I'm trying to hit a certain shot, a, actually when I'm trying to hit a low short iron, I think of Justin Leonard's finish. Mm. Just low and around, kind of, and I'm trying to hit a, trying to hit a high, high driver with some distance. I'll think of Tiger's big high finish where it's almost straight vertical, just to get it in the air because I'm a low ball hitter. And those little things, I think you know, YouTube can help you. But uh, I don't know if you're trying to mirror it. I think you can get out of what, what you do as a player or what a, you know, like you said for your listeners or your viewers, what what's good for them or what 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 makes them them and that's the beauty of golf is is there's so many different ways to do it and you got Jim Furyk swinging it one way and Tiger Woods of 2000 is is borderline perfect and they both made a lot of birdies and a lot of money no doubt about it. a lot it. of ways to before do it. we get to your pro career I want to ask you about one little amateur event which was the Walker Cup in 2001 yes at Ocean Forest yes. where your team was loaded loaded and y'all got slapped around a little bit. Smoked. <laughs> Flat smoked. And, I, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago at the Open Championship, I did a uh, I did a little driving range bit with Nick Doherty, who was on that team. And he reminded me uh, not quite as eloquently as you, and you were even direct right then. But, uh, no, we did. We got spanked. We got slapped around pretty good. I, uh, I remember playing Luke Donald uh, and Nick. Nick Cassini and I played them in a four ball, and then I played Luke in the singles. I think I was three under through four and two down to Luke. So huh. three under yeah. four and two down. Yeah, yeah, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I think he was. Well, that seems fun, guys. Yeah, I think <laughs> tighten it, was, it up, yeah, Lucas. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry, guys. I think, I think he. Yeah, I think three birdies and an eagle, or four birdies and an eagle for him. And I'm just going, yeah, okay. He, he's going to do all right to the next level. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's the statute of limitations on the bragging right for stuff like going back to the Walker Cup? The dudes are still on that team. Like bring that up. Yeah, I think. I think or similar college to college even yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, I think similar to a to a you know. 1997 rider. Don't think Azinger doesn't remind Faldo anytime he <laughs> yeah. can about oh, that singles sure at the Belfry, that. right? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think that's lifelong bragging rights. A team event like that, or a singles match, or a real hotly contested, you know, whatever it may be. I think you, I think you take that with you as long as you want. Yeah, bragging rights are indefinite. Oh, for sure, forever, yeah, infinite. Playing for pride's more fun than 100 bucks sometimes. So. Correct. Well, Except sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sometimes. Hundred's nice. <laughs> I like the action. Hundred ain't bad. But you know, 2004 was your rookie year on tour. Finished 134th on the money list. Got your card back, and then you win in unbelievable fashion at yes. Disney in 2005. We got to talk about this. That was the sickest. I actually looked this up this morning to rewatch it. I mean, 35 yard bunker shot, which ended up you hold to win the golf tournament. Right. Where I think most people would be like, dear God, just get this up and down somehow and yeah, get yeah. the playoff. Well, that's what I was thinking. Well, I was so far ahead of the guys in the last group. I think I was four or five groups ahead. Um, and that was – I knew – similar to a couple of weeks back, and I'm sure we'll get there, but mm -hmm. I, I had – I just – I wanted – I had a number in mind that I wanted to get there and, and press, press, press to get there. And kind of a squirrely drive off 18, of course, bad second shot, and then I'm in this bunker. I'm like, back pin, got another bunker to go over. All right, let's – you know, make good contact first, give herself eight, ten feet, see what happens at the end, and it goes in. You know, that was just – it was just one of those. But, um, yeah, exactly uh, exactly what you said. Get it up and down, see what happens, and then it went in. So That was one of the nastiest hole-outs to win that, like, it doesn't – you know, there's, seen, there's been some bunker shots to hole-out to win, Jordan Spieth, you know, mm. that one's, like, given the level of difficulty is yeah, disgusting. When Pernice yeah. got in, because you beat Tom Pernice, I believe, sure. in that turn, did, he didn't know, clearly, like, what you had done to get right. there. Did, when, he saw it, when he saw it, did he say anything to you? Like, are you freaking kidding me? Uh, I didn't see him till the next week. I was on the range because I was fully expecting a playoff. I was on the range. I think he did what he did, signed his card, and then obviously they take you away. And I saw him the next week. I want to say it was in Tampa. And, and he just kind of – he just winked and laughed and just shook his head at me. But uh, – You son uh, of a bitch. Yeah, well, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. I think that was uh, – Yeah. That was the veteran way of saying that to a 24 or 5-year-old, whatever yeah. I was then. <laughs> that's – I mean, what a way to get your first win. But, yeah. you know, you have, you have four PJ Tour wins now, including the 2009 U.S. Open, which is – where I think the world really found out about Lucas Glover. First off, you, you go through sectional qualifying, which sucks, 36 holes in a day. Yeah. It's not really enjoyable. No. 
And then you're rewarded by getting to go play Beth Page Black yes. for four days. Yes. Take us through that week because, I mean, I don't hit it anywhere, so that's my biggest nightmare on the planet is that golf course. Sure. But you were the guy who hoisted the trophy at the end of the week. Yeah, no, it was um, the way this crazy, silly game works, as you guys know. I missed the cut at Memorial, and I'm playing awful. And I got this Monday qualifier, and I got to find something. Practice at Memorial, played a little bit at the lakes in Brookwood Saturday, Sunday, and kind of found something that uh, – at Memorial on the range at Muirfield and took it with me that Monday and hit it nice, hooped everything the first day, 63 at the lakes, and then just hung on at Brookwood. Got home practicing with my uh, my grandfather, and before events like that, he'd say, who cares about the driving range? Let's go on the golf course, just hit a bunch of shots. And so we did it, and we were driving back from, from practicing, and, and he said, I, I counted. Uh, we hit two or three drives off every tee. He said, I, I counted at least – 12 drives that we could have um, taken two to three steps to uh, to pick up. He said, I'd keep doing what you're doing. I said, all right, well, I'll take that with So I took that with me the next week, and it was a simple little takeaway move, just kind of let the toe swing open. I remember like it was yesterday, just let the toe swing open and then just go. And all of a sudden, they started hitting it nice again. So I get up there, and it's crazy wet, crazy nasty, rain out, uh, basically rained out practice rounds Wednesday. I didn't hit a shot Thursday. Nothing on the driving range, nothing. I mean, I don't know that guys – I don't. I think there were a few guys that finished five or six holes Thursday. Friday comes around, I think I played five holes. So it was just a weird, odd week. And then for the rest of the week, it was play till dark and pizza, burger on the way home, bed up at five and go do it all over again. And it compacted it and just mushed it all together. There wasn't much time to think about it. There wasn't much time to get nervous. I mean, we finished Monday. My first shot Monday was a pitching wedge out of the second fairway. I mean, how often does that – mm-hmm. you just – doesn't happen that much. Um, but the week itself was as crazy and odd as it was. I was just – I was hitting my numbers. I was hitting it in the fairway. Um, I think I had one three-putt for the week um, on those greens and those conditions, wet, the Poana. Those just, wonderful New York crowds. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, they were uh, – <laughs> luckily, I think somebody on my benefit snuck in there. I was a Yankees fan, so they were behind me, but uh, a little bit. But um, no, it was a, it, obviously a great week and, and a great ball striking week, and putting inside 10 feet was nails. And I was just executing coming down the stretch, and that's what you take from those things. The most gratifying thing is, all right, this is the highest pressure a golfer can be under, and to hit the shots you see – and uh, your speed's good, your hands feel good, and, and you just, man, that was. Does, does it feel any different coming down the stretch there compared to John Deere a few weeks ago, Disney when you when No, you went? no, the the focus and the the focus and the the mind is so into it that yeah, there's nerves, but the the focus is so there. All you're thinking about, is, I got 162, I got to hit this 162 into this left or right wind and, and you just go if you start thinking about it and I think you know like I've said after the deer that's when you kind of well, I'll just make par here I'm gonna be all right that's, <laughs> some people can operate like that I, I gotta I gotta hit it I gotta be aggressive this is this is all I'm doing and all I'm trying to do is make birdies and this is kind of how it was that week deer Disney Wells Fargo whatever you're just there 165 170 eight iron seven iron what's the right club coop go and so to say I was more nervous here versus there, the answer is no. It's it's all the same. It's just the um, you're just that moment in that zone. Athletes like to talk about, and it's true. You just get into that that mindset. In hindsight, do you think the weather being with the weird week? You said it was like there wasn't much time to think. Was it hmm. easier for you maybe actually that it was so jammed up like that? Even though it was still a longer week, it was five days instead of four. Well, first first major in contention yeah. and not having to sleep on being tied with Ricky or one ahead or one behind or whatever it would have been um, had we stopped on after 54 holes. I don't remember how we stood. We played 55 and a half holes and then got up Monday. But to not have to sleep on it with that 225 East Coast yeah. tee time, yeah, probably was an advantage as a 29-year-old never having been there before. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not going to say it, it, it didn't help. But um, you know, I don't know. I don't know one way or the other. But it, it couldn't have hurt. Yeah, that two that 
early afternoon tea time yeah, for a yeah. guy trying to win. It's got to yeah. be the worst stretch, yeah. worst waiting in yeah. golf. You know you're not going to sleep good. You know you're going to be up at 5.30, and you just, what do you do all you got to kill eight hours. Yeah, I had a 3.54 at the Open this year, and, I mean, just. Yeah, I, was, happy hour by the time you tee <laughs> off. <laughs> that yeah. sucks. Right, a plate's, yeah. the plate's are bad. I probably should have started with that. <laughs> but, you know, you, you win a major championship. You're a very laid-back guy. Did life change at all for you after you won a major? It did. It did. Um, I always joke about this, but it was true. All of a sudden, a lot of people ask me what I thought about things. Mm. So it's not the same thing I thought two weeks ago. You know, I still, you know, I, but um, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but kind of not. You know, it, my, my views on, and my opinions and all that didn't change, but all of a sudden people cared more. Um, managers, manager called and said, now you actually have to get a phone that works. <laughs> and yeah, um, good advice. Yeah, so yeah. I'm gonna have to be able to get a, a hold of you via email, phone call, whatever. So that was my first like smartphone. I was like, this is awful. I was still on the flip, you know, that just <laughs> can text with you know, take seven minutes to push OK. But um, yeah, it got busy. I got in some awesome tournaments, turned down some awesome tournaments just to rest because I played. I think I played the four in a row after that. You played incredible too. I, I, I had I was on a run. I didn't want to stop, and I actually had to stop. I got shin splints at Turnberry that year, and they <laughs> said you're you're done for a while. And, All right, dang, I'm playing nice, but um, yeah, it, it just changed in that regard. I got in bigger tournaments and got in got to play a bunch of really really great golf courses with a bunch of guys I hadn't been playing with until that happened. Did you like the spotlight? Because you're a pretty, you know, chill dude. Like, you're not out there making a bunch of noise and stuff. When you go from just, all right, regular tour player to, boom, U.S. Open champion, there's a big light that comes on. Did yeah. you like that, or, or is that cumbersome? I, did, I didn't love it, um, but I feel like I handled it well. I didn't change it all. I, I wasn't going to hang out yeah. with different people, act different, um, any of that stuff. But, um, like I said, I just – I got – I got better tee times with higher profile players and, and got in some really awesome events for five years in a row. Um, whether that that changed, my schedule changed, I can honestly say as a person or my mindset or any of that didn't change. Now, are there expectations that go along with it? Yes, that's the mental side of it. There was some expectations to be tempered, um, but showed up at the PGA and, and, and finished top five. And that was kind of a, that was kind of a, all right, I can do this more and more. Like a validation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like U.S. Open was a springboard, and then, all right, get to that PGA, and Y.E. Yang obviously won. Tiger played great and um, right there at the end. But, it, uh, you know, I was kind of there for a while, hanging around, and and I don't think I had a great Sunday. I don't remember exactly. But um, that was a valid – yeah, exactly, validation of, all right, I can do this. And hadn't been back there, hadn't been in that position um, again in a major. But – that little three month span, um, I was playing nice. Yeah, that was some nice golf. Nice for the bank. Yeah, account Grand too. Slam. Yeah. Are yeah. you surprised at all you didn't win an Emmy for that Nike commercial? After Just you a three footer, so, pal? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that was incredible. Yeah, yeah, that was a great, great ad. Their writers were fantastic, but they jinxed me because I've had the yips since I've made that damn <laughs> thing. We're not talking about that. We are not talking don't about that. Don't use that. Don't say that. <laughs> Edit that. Cut that. No, don't edit that. That's good. That's great. It's, how, uh, many times it, how many times did it, it take you for that commercial? Oh man, that part not many. I remember, uh, I remember the oven in, in Fort Worth there with Nike uh, on the short game area, and uh, yeah, we nailed it in a couple. It wasn't too bad. They but me. <laughs> <laughs> ever since then, <laughs> uh, maybe two years after that. No, I'm just kidding. But that's uh, fantastic. No, you got to leave that in. That's good stuff. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. yeah, we love it. Oh, I want to talk about it. So you win in 2009, then you win in 2011 again. 2015, you don't have the best year. Yeah. You find yourself going back to finals which mm -hmm. i mean you're a major champion not yep. that long ago you won again in the meantime now you're back there you got it back easily or you know yeah. nothing's easy but yeah. you got it back with room to spare what's that like going from you know six years ago man i'm freaking u.s open champ and now i'm back here with these yeah. guys i've never heard of yeah yeah well i, I mean i'd heard of a bunch of them because this game's hard yeah you know, it's hard but and i said this after the deer a couple of weeks ago perspective comes with struggle and i'd struggled for a couple of years and the perspective that i learned was this game's hard it's hard. It's still a round ball and a flat object, and it's a fine-tuned motor skill sport, and it's hard. And those struggles lent me that perspective, and I still hold on to it, you know, and, but that's maturity too, I guess. But struggling, you know, I struggled at the, the, the Open after winning the deer, and it's just it's a hard game, and it's a hard game to play well consistently for a really, really long time um, without some down years, without some lean years. Um, to answer your question, in 2015, it was more of I have an opportunity to get my job back. 
and that's how I went into the Corn Ferry Finals was I, I have an opportunity to get my full card back. I think I was, I don't know if I was in the 150 or not, but I had an opportunity to go get my job back. And I was playing well enough to where if I didn't just make a complete, you know, you know what of myself, I was probably gonna finish in that, in that number. And I was able to do it, thankfully. And then um, I think I went back again in, I don't know, 17 or 18, and that was the same mindset. It's hard. I'm struggling. It's hard, but I've got a chance. I've got an opportunity, um, and I'm still good enough. I just uh, got to put a couple weeks together, or in that, in that format, one good week mm-hmm. gets you through. And um, one week I played solid the whole time, and or one year I played solid the whole time. The other year I think I had one really good finish, and um, and got it that way. But it's just perspective. Yeah, yeah. it's just so much. It's so easier said than exactly. done because I ran into a player at the airport on my way here who had had his card for a number of years. But he just recently, his medical ran out, and he was on his way to Utah to play in the Corn Ferry event. And he's just like, man, this sucks. i got to go play in this event. Can't make any money out here and all this. And I'm like, that's the problem is you play out here for so long, then you have to go back. Yeah, yeah. And that attitude will get the best of you. Yeah, that attitude will get the best of you. And there's a bunch of bunch of hungry people with the right attitude that mm-hmm. uh, that will beat your brains in. Yeah, there's 22-year-old kids that are like, I'm so happy to be yeah, here right now. I, I want that shot. Play. Right. Or a guy that. It's coming off a of medical and barely got his status out there. So many different scenarios, and 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 like you know, it's it's all about perspective. And yeah. if you don't if you don't give yourself the if you don't give yourself the right chance mentally, it's 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 even harder. Yeah. Um, in, so, in 2018, when you went back, I mean, you got out on tour in 2004. You'd already had a long career. I mean, that's a long career on the PGA Tour. If you hadn't gotten it back, then was there any hesitation you would have had going back to the Corn Ferry Tour and playing there? Um, I think no. I don't think I would have. You would have done it, no question. Well, I don't know that I would have had to play it full full year. You know, yeah, the you whole had schedule. Some, out yeah, I'd have had past champion out here and gotten fair share of exemptions and whatnot. But um, no, I wouldn't have had any problems playing as many as I needed to out there to, you know, support my family and do what I needed to do. And um, you know, at, at at this point, that's 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 what it comes down to. You do what you got to do to get better. You do what you got to do to support the people you got to support and yourself, and still try to, you know. At the same time, you're playing for a trophy and not money. That's mm-hmm. the hard, that's the hard, um, that's the hard mental breakthrough. Now is I got a family, I got to support them. But how do I keep money out of it? I'm still playing for trophies instead of um, mm-hmm. I'm just cashing the check. So that's good. And you get that mindset, and you, you you're down the road again. Yeah. But you know, over the last decade, there's been there's been some up and downs. Mm-hmm. You know, you you really started to turn it around this year, and then you get to John Deere. And you put it all together. Sunday, I mean, I picked up your group with CBS, I believe, on the 13th hole, and you just put on a clinic coming in. You know, what was going through the mind trying to break that decade-long winless streak? Get to 20 under. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that was it. Simple. That, and you didn't even need to do that. You didn't have I know, to. I didn't. Well, I wanted to. That's why I went for it on 18. But um, I had that number in my head. I, I, I looked at the board coming off nine. I made a great birdie on eight um, to kind of – enough of a birdie to take a look after nine and see where everybody was doing and nobody was really going crazy behind me I said all right we got us we got a 31 or two back here and I was just trying to keep pressing keep pressing and I knew it was close I knew if a couple iron shots just got close a couple putts when it's something to get the ball rolling terrible line for a golf conversation but um, anything could happen on that back nine you've played there you've been there got a drivable hole got par fives you can get at and some wedges and 16s of nine iron wedge par three and it was just one of those situations where I was motivated to get to 20 under if it was possible and I had a chance and 10 year drought never entered my mind I can honestly say that it did after you know wow this was that was a long time coming a lot of hard work a lot of struggles and um but out there that day I knew I was playing nice and I knew I was hitting it good enough to make some birdies and just make a couple putts, make a couple of those mid-rangers. You're not going to hit it five feet every hole. but uh, You uh, damn near did. No, I tried. <laughs> it seems like you did. I tried. Yeah. I like 14, yeah. beautiful. The, I mean, the big one, though, was obviously 17, yeah. where you made the 12-footer that broke about a, a yeah. foot. That was that looked like you. That kind of that, yeah. that, that dripped in like cold. What, what, on Friday morning before I booked my flight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, that, yeah, 17 was um, – Again, standing on 17 T. All right, we're into it's raining, it's chilly for there in, was, in July. Yeah. Um, I'm not getting there, so let's get it in the fairway and you know, good smart layup, try to get a good number. And it's a good pin um, to spin it back to. So I wanted that full 
and I, uh, and you know the ball wasn't going anywhere. I think I had like 109, and I hit my 52, which is like a 130 club. Mm. So um, just a different, a very different week there with conditions. But um, yeah, I knew I knew I was laying up, and I just wanted to get a good number to where I could spin it back to that hole. And even if it stayed left, it's uh, there's no danger there. You're not yeah. going down to right or anything like that. Big breaking putt. Um, but I was reading them nice. I read them good all week. If I got it on my line, I made them. And um, they were just that perfect make speed yeah. and just get it going, get it on line. And that was one of those, you know you're not going to hit it too hard, so you might give it about half a ball more break, and it just it just dripped in the front. An 18 at TPC Deer Run might be one of the best finishing holes on the PGA Tour. Agreed, agreed. I mean, you, you can't fake any shot on no. that hole. No, you can't, yeah, you miss left, you're in that fairway bunker. Um, difficult shot because then the water's in play. You miss right, you got the tree. Um, I went, I hit three wood because I didn't want the bunker, and um, and I hit it down the right. Got a fortunate break out of the rough. You got I think. a very nice bounce. Yes, it did. I, yeah, and then first cut, and I, I think I got a little water jumper. Um, I, I think high one eighties, and eighties a seven iron for me right now, and I think it just jumped a little. No plans to fly that hole high. I was trying to use the green to run it back to it, but uh, I was pleased with how aggressive I was, and and uh, I hit a nice shot. I think it just jumped a hair. It was it was really cool. I mean, this game is you know such a game of inches. Yeah. Like your ball was in the first cut by. Six, seven inches. Yeah. If it's six inches to the left, I mean, you're marking that clean in it. Yeah. Dry ball, no problem right. at all. Or if it's six, seven yeah. inches to the then right. Have a bigger problem. Well, yeah. Luckily, I was far enough down. Um, a little adrenaline on that three wood, I think. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know if it would get around the corner, but it did. Yeah. Th- six, seven inches the other way, to your point, might have to think about laying it up and wedging it back to that pin. But um, yeah, game of inches, game of uh, good bounces, bad bounces, and it's golf. It's hard. With the, like, I mean, you've been winning tournaments since you're in, you know, junior golf, college golf, all that stuff. But with, like, the 2018 going back to Corn Ferry Finals and then, you know, the 10-year drought and all that, where does John Deere rank in terms of, like, most gratifying? Oh, it's way up there. It's way up there. Probably the most because I'm 41. Yeah. And, you know, now looking back on it, 10-year drought, going back to Corn Ferry a couple times, finals a couple times, and and just going through the the, the struggles, the golf struggles. I mean, that's all it is. It's yeah. just golf. I mean, you look at anybody's – career on a graph and every one of them does this for two years or 20 um it's crazy but um yeah gratifying um definitely the most just because of the the length of time had passed from my last win and 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 what was so gratifying about it is it didn't shy away from like you know you could smell it yeah you kind of smell the blood in the water whatever however you want to phrase it but i could smell it and it didn't uh didn't freak me out was there ever a time during the years prior in between, I guess, the 10-year gap where you doubted yourself, like, maybe I'm done winning? No. Maybe I won't? Yeah, no. it seems like you have, a, like, a great perspective on even when things aren't going great. Always. And, two, pers- again, perspective. You see numerous guys on tour that will miss three or four cuts in a row win or finish 54th, miss cut, 53rd, miss cut, miss cut, win. So always in the back of your mind, it's just something. Something clicks. Something clicks or you get closer to the, the putter – on the putting green on Tuesday just to try it and you start hooping everything and boom, you have a big week. Just, yeah, that that's the, again, the maturity, the growing, the perspectives from the struggle. As you know, it's just one week that can change it. Or it could be, you know, to be honest, in Detroit, I wasn't having a nice week. I started trying some stuff and it clicked a little bit. And next thing you know, I changed the grip on my my putter on uh, at the deer and start hooping everything. Well, it, it was awesome to watch. You know, I Thank was happy you. to be there and follow that group. Well, I appreciate I know that it. was one of the most popular – I mean, it was very popular amongst your peers out there, well, which I you. think is one of the coolest things that can happen. When when all your peers congratulate you, it has to mean a lot. Yeah, coolest thing about winning, I've said this for years, is your peers congratulating you then or the next week. Mm-hmm. And on tour, it's usually the next week because everybody's got families to see or other tournaments to go to. But I got, you know, getting to the open and, and guys that, that, you know, I know well and don't know well come up to you and shake your hand or pat you on the back or – covid times fist bump or whatever um yeah that's that's when it all sinks in you're like all right these guys you know yeah i beat these guys but they understand that you know nick this week could be their week and i'm gonna do the same thing for them and that's it's the coolest thing about winning on tour did you hear from anyone after you won that one that you're particularly like surprised to hear from like oh wow that was nice of that guy to reach out no no i didn't no really players other than um guys I, i would see um but yeah i think i had 
225 texts to return Monday at the open. I took, That's tough on a flip phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the answers would have been shorter yeah, back then. Yeah. Oh, you're Smiley right. face. Yeah, exactly. Send. Send. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. All right, let's get to the E9. <laughs> yeah. All right, we do this, Lucas. Nine fun questions to get to know just a little bit more about you. All right. All right, we ask this to everybody. You can trade lives with someone for one day, dead or alive. Who's it going to be? Dead or alive, trade with one person. Whew. That's a good one. Ken Follett, an author, my favorite author. Oh, wow. That's Colts, too. That's weird. Yes. That's really? Colts, Ken same Follett? guy. I have what, no idea. What's your favorite book of his again? I <laughs> forgot that one you always talk about. <laughs> and, yeah, and only to so I can actually figure out what goes in his, into, in his mind, goes on in his mind to figure out how he writes these books. Okay, give me. Wow, that's the most favorite, intellectual answer we've yeah, ever had yeah, by, by a mile. Give me Kevin Follett's, your favorite Ken book. Follett. Ken Follett. Ken. See, I don't even know his name. <laughs> All right, give me Dr. Seuss. What do you like? Yeah. Pillars of the Earth is Ken, of the Earth. Ken Follett's most famous book. Right. Is there an audio book of that for maybe the Probably. slower readers in the Probably. group? Probably. <laughs> Probably. All right, yeah. I got another reading question for you right. coming up here, but I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay. That is the, by far and away the most yeah, just, uh, intellectual. Yeah. He blows me away every book he writes, and I just I'd like to know how he. I does love it. that. Yeah. Or I expect the hell out of that. All right, next one. Confirm, this little, confirm or deny. You fell asleep face down, head on the table, passed out at your PGA Tour rookie orientation meeting. This is from? Confirm. Yeah, okay. Confirm. That was real. They're yeah. boring. Yeah. Confirm. Confirm. Yeah. Okay. Celebrate I didn't know. Yeah. Or the source that gave it to me, not the most reliable. He, yeah. he was probably right there with you. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I'm, I don't, I, he mentioned names. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. We protect our sources yeah. here, too. All right. There's a lot of famous sayings out there in the world. You know, if you don't use it, you lose it. No glove, no love. You agree with that? No glove, no love. Yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> not. I don't I mean, know. Just for you, it's like I wanted to throw that in there on the broadcast, and I'm like, I'm too new at this. I'll yeah. probably get fired. Yeah, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't really thought about it that much. I guess the gloves, wrong hand. You use no glove, and you yeah. get lots of love yeah. out there on the golf course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There we go. No we'll glove, go with that. No love. Perfect. Yeah. I never go. really subscribed to that. Yeah. All right, next one. <laughs> Whose hair would you rather have for the next year, Trevor Lawrence or Cam Smith? Trevor Lawrence. You like sure. that flow? Uh, I like it better than Cam's. <laughs> <laughs> Cam owns it, though. He oh, he great. does. He He's does. doing he that does. thing. That visor over at the Olympics. Oh, made buddy. Him wear, oh, well, oh, yeah. when, when he let it out that his mom didn't like it, that gives it up for yep. – to- he's a wide-open target yep. if mom doesn't like it. and He's he's free. He's fair game. Yep. Girlfriend right. didn't like it, but <laughs> it's working. On, we can stay on with Trevor Lawrence. Just, let's just imagine things are going to go normal for the next while, okay? Who – Clemson Tiger quarterback, better NFL career, Deshaun Watson or Trevor Lawrence at the end of the day? At the end of it all, um, Trevor, be, not because he's better individually than Deshaun, but I think he's got better um, structure around him currently okay. than Deshaun has had or will have. Okay, fair enough. Uh, all right, here's my reading question. Okay. I read, you can tell me if this is true or false, that you read four books during your U.S. Open win in 2009. True. True? True. All right, do you remember what they were? Do not. Okay. They were all they were all airport books. I call them airport. I was gonna books. say four. I mean, yeah, the ones you can pick up and, and read. Cat in the high. Yeah, yeah, a few of those out, but real yeah. books. Yeah, four no, is getting it done. Yeah, well, I traveled with two, and then I saw the forecast and grabbed two more at the airport, and they just buzzed through them. All right, yeah. nothing mind, like crazy no, mind no, no. blowing that no, led to the no, wind or no, no, the winter. No, no, no thousand page can follow. Are you still like reading that? like every week when you're out here? Are you mm-hmm. like go back to the room? fair fair amount. Not a, not as much as I used to. A lot of FaceTime with the kids, and when I'd usually be reading and. I've gotten kind of addicted to crosswords a little more than books now. So, <laughs> but um, anything to pass the time. We, Colt knows. I mean, you, you travel. You're alone a lot. Yeah. And you you got to find something to do. Other, you know, Netflix can. Um, I think I might have finished Netflix during COVID, so I got to mm. move on to something. What's your genre of books like? Do you have one particularly that you like? Um, murder mystery, spy yeah. stuff. Um, Daniel Silva is another favorite. He just had a new one come out. I read that one on vacation a couple of weeks back. So, uh, but mostly fiction, historical fiction. I like. I like the guys that will take real events, make some fiction out of that, but still get a history lesson at the so same time. So you can learn a little something, yeah. but get a little yeah. Hollywood. Eric too. Larson. He's a he's a classic. So. Great caddy too. Yep, you're right. Elar. <laughs> Elar. That's exactly right. I love that. That's man. how I remember the author's name. Yeah. I think of Harris's caddy. That is great. All right. Well, mentioned U.S. Open winner. Great trophy. Yep. Okay. Got a lid on it. Do what you want with it. What's What's your favorite thing you did with the U.S. Open trophy? Drank out of it, of course. Favorite. What? what okay. Favorite thing you drank out of it? Red wine. Mm. Is that your go-to? 
Yeah, I like it. I do like a glass of red wine. Okay. I don't drink much on the road anymore, but at home, yeah, I'm, I'm if, we're, if I'm in the kitchen cooking or my wife's cooking, I'll, yeah, we 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 like to split a bottle of red about every night. Sidebar question: This isn't part of the E nine. Like you, you don't appear to like splurge on crazy stuff. If you win something, you're going to reward yourself. Like John Deere, what is it that you? Is it wine, watches, car? You got any sort of thing we, like that you love? We had a vacation planned for my wife's fortieth, which is next week, but we had it planned actually for this week. Got in here, so backed it up to last week, and uh, yeah, I might have ordered a few more expensive bottles and a bigger steak than maybe normal. But okay. uh, yeah, we drank uh, we drank some nice some nice french wine last week on vacation and, and enjoyed it which uh was my present to my wife and i for for the win so things you consume like that. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah yeah definitely not a collector i'm a yeah. consumer no <laughs> watches or polter or barn rat situation with the garages all right here's my next one all right an alien comes down from outer space he doesn't know anything about the u.s or anywhere you got to explain to him the difference between the university of south carolina and clemson how do you do it <laughs> what's the difference between those two winning and losing <laughs> perfect <laughs> that, that's, that's as simple yeah. as it is pretty much okay yeah, pretty much all right yeah. winning and losing yeah like do you have an actual like hatred for the university of south carolina hatred no strong dislike yeah. yes i mean that it, it, it is an education of higher learning according to their graduates mm -hmm. so um yeah no i don't hate them but i'm not allowed to say anything positive or like them perfect. at all just from a just the way you know blood runneth orange and all that yeah all right, well, last winning and one. losing. Yep. That's it. Yep. Last one. You win the U.S. Open. You're a Clemson Tiger. You get to go home to Death Valley and do the tradition of touching Howard's Rock and then leading the the team down onto the field. First off, we got to talk about this hill y'all run down, which yep. is terrifying, and I don't understand <laughs> how y'all's football coaches or athletic director lets this even happen. Well, the history behind it. So my grandfather was there in 1948 to 52, and when he was still there, they got dressed at uh, it's called Fike Fieldhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously with facilities the way they are, they're not there anymore. Fike's still there. It's uh, where the, all the intramural sports are played. Um, and I think it's I think it's professor offices now, but those used to be uh, where the athletes stayed and then where they dressed and came down. And it's literally, you go right down the road and down the hill from Fike to get into, and that's how they got into the stadium for to play. And um, so that the tradition just stayed. And then I think 1963, um, an alumnus brought Coach Howard, Frank Howard, a uh, rock from Death Valley, California, and uh -huh. he propped it up, prop, literally used it to prop his office door up on campus, or prop it open, excuse me. And um, the lore is, or the, the, the story is, he, uh, he, he finally moved it one time, and we got off a losing streak when he moved it. And he said, well, maybe that thing's lucky or weird or something. And so he he had it installed at the top of the hill to uh, mainly just mind put a mind trick on the guys, and it stayed. And so now, uh, yeah, ride around from the locker room, get off the bus, touch the rock, and run down the hill. Um, trick to the hill is there's a little bump about three quarters of the way down, and if you're not expecting it, you could completely eat it coming down. Yeah, and it's I'm been shocked done. people don't. I've more. seen player. I've seen players do it. Unfortunately, I've seen a, a cameraman for a local TV station who was a friend who thought it'd be cool to try to go down backwards, film the team oh, coming from this direction, yeah. and he ate it. And I think that was a broken collarbone and maybe a femur even. Um, but um, <laughs> so luckily, I knew that. And uh, but uh, no, Dabo was so sweet, and he'd heard that that was a bucket list of mine. And I believe it was uh, November seventh, Florida State night game and mm. um yeah we torched them how that, nervous were you going down that hill? yeah how was that run? i was much more nervous than uh, any shot i hit at the u.s open that's for that's sure correct. were you at the yeah. front right first like first I, coming out yeah, or did I you follow, i followed back? coach i yeah. followed Debo. Mm. he said uh he said follow me i'm going he said when i hit the bottom you won't catch me though <laughs> <laughs> if that you hit the bottom awesome. yeah, yeah. And he does he cooks it going through there i mean he's four or five flat going from from the goal line to the sideline i feel like the line for clemson football games shouldn't be set until everybody makes it down the hill i agree i agree with that <laughs> yeah dude that's an acl that. waiting yeah 100 percent. i honestly they i think they practice the freshman going down it because if God. yeah 
Well, it's funny. A little the, drizzle. Oh man, yeah. no, no, you're 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 eating it going down if you if you're not careful. <laughs> the linemen take it easy. Those skill players, they go. Yeah, and yeah. There used to be a little thing that some of them would jump off the little bump, and Dabo, I think Dabo put a stop to that. After <laughs> yeah. a, I would have been wheeling Trevor Lawrence man. down in like a yeah. in a wheelchair. Exactly. Hey, buddy, we're gonna go ahead and get yeah. you down there. You're gonna be the captain. You, you every can run down game, it afterwards. So you don't have to run yeah. down. Awesome, yeah. Lucas Glover. Thank you so much, my man. Thanks, yeah, awesome. we oh, appreciate was. you, bro. Good times. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, that was Lucas Glover on Golf Subpar. Sleaze, you never met the man before. Give me your thoughts. Love him, dude. Love him. I think he'd be an incredible guy to sit down and drink a little wine or whatever with. I think he's got a a wide range of topics he can talk about. Very well-read guy. One of the only guys that I've (laughs) – uh, uh, definitely amongst our friends that are like oh yeah i read three books that week i was like oh that 30, week are you mean meaning in, like in your whole life we talking full-time resume here but i mean i thought that was cool about the u.s open he read three books that week and honestly getting into that week one thing that i guess i never really just thought about the fact that that week was so condensed and jammed up and like they had to go out and play when the windows gave them opportunities to the fact that he got to go out there on the monday and finish without having to you know we talked to these guys like dude the worst part i don't tee off till 248 mm-hmm sitting around and killing all that time is the worst because your brain just goes crazy he didn't have that at beth page when he won i think that's probably a that's a, a huge um i guess a huge advantage for a guy trying to win a, a major championship for the first time and we were not going to bring it up because he does have some little putting issues but we don't like to talk about that stuff unless it's with graham delette because he's our guy and he's not really playing golf right now right but he can handle it but yeah but lucas you know had a little issue with the short putts and he goes back and he goes you know come to think of it when he filmed that nike commercial and he told the kid, he goes, heck, kid, it was just a three-footer. He goes, that's kind of when I got the yips. Maybe it's Nike's fault. I blame Nike. Blame the swoosh. Blame uh, the oven. But how, can you imagine playing in you know, the middle of summer on the PGA Tour, these hot, humid places in the Midwest, no glove? Dude, I always wanted to be a no glove because I love Freddie growing up, right? Mm-hmm. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So, like, as a kid, I would go out there and hit with no glove, and I'd slap it around, put on a glove, and it was, like, 10 times better. I always wanted to be a no glove guy, but could never do it. I, I have no clue at the speed these guys swing and all that, how he gets it done. And some some of these places, I mean, you see the glove coming on, wiping off the towel, grip, getting it wet, and then drying it, all the different stuff. I mean, I, I don't know, but I'm envious of it. And I think if the whole tour, if they did away with gloves, you might be looking at the number one player in the world. Well, he should try the Quater glove, and he might change his mind. Yeah, he should get one of those red, white, and blues. No doubt about it. But, man, the thing I was really excited to talk to him about was Death Valley. And running, you know, touching the rock there at Clemson. He did it after the U.S. Open, and then running down the hill. I don't understand how Dabo Sweeney has not outlawed this tradition of running down the hill onto the football field. It is terrifying to me. I don't understand how some star player has not gotten injured and out for the season. But Lucas did it, and he agreed. It's uh, It's steep. And it's very nerve-wracking. Uh, if I'm Dabo last year, Trevor Lawrence is on my team. But yeah. Okay, bud, the whole team's going to run out. Then we're going to bring you down in a wheelchair yes. uh, monitored by a, a armed security tank in front and behind. Like It's just that would be the worst way to lose to end a season. But I see it all the time in the night games. I mean, they come piling down there. Then you got that rock in the middle if you're not paying attention. Or maybe it starts drizzling a little bit and the thing Ugh. gets wet. I'm just like, dude, somebody, one of these days. He's going to have a spill down that thing. But, uh, I mean, what a sweet deal for a place like Death Valley. I mean, one of the best atmospheres in all of college football to lead your squad down that thing. I mean, I just get get a little goosies just thinking about it. Yeah. And, you know, he broke that winless drought of seven years at the John Deere. And it's I think it's one of the coolest things is when it's popular amongst your peers. Like, that was a very, very popular win, mm-hmm. much like a Tony Fiena out at Northern Trust. Like, it's so cool when all of the PGA Tour is congratulating you. Especially when, like, for a guy like Lucas who'd gone through that drought and things like that, not only did he not win, but like he had to go get back and get his tour card multiple times. You know what I mean? The tour was almost gone. He might've been playing the corn Ferry tour, but playing on conditional status or things like that. So he went to like the top of the mountain, major champion, us open champion, everybody, you know, watching you to, I might not have a job on this tour next year, then to get back to the winter circle. I mean, that's why he says like, man, that was maybe the most special one. Like you have such a new appreciation, I think for, what it means to win out on the PJ Tour and how hard it is because you've been to the top and you've been to the bottom and uh, there's not a ton of guys that are able to do that. There's guys that go to the top and then fall off, but not a lot of them come back. It's crazy. I used to play a lot of practice rounds with Lucas. We'd always have some action, um, him, myself, Ches Reeve, and then someone else. And I just would always remember we'd play on Tuesday and I'm like, my God, does he make this game look way easier than I do. Just stripes it. Ball sounds incredible coming off the club face. But then you get to the green and there's a little bit of iffy thing, but it's gotten a lot better. He has turned it around this year, has starting to roll the rock much, much better. But, dude, I tell you what, you walk up and down the range and not many 
there's not a much better audio from a tour player than Lucas Glover. I was Glover. just going to ask you, so I ask a lot of tour, like, who's the most impressive? Who's the guy you want to you want to watch hit the golf ball like that you would stop on the range and watch. And there's like three names that come up more often than anyone else. One's Henrik Stenson during his day. He's like the long irons are a joke the way he can hit it. And that three wood too. Sergio Garcia gets brought up by a lot of them and Lucas Glover. Yeah. They're like, dude, just the sound, the flushness every time he's a flusher. He's one of those, you hear that term thrown out for a few guys. They like, even he said, I think in the, in the interview was like, you know, sometimes I have too much curve on my ball, but hitting it out of the middle and never, never been a problem. He's like, I sometimes get a little too much right to left and bend it too much. I got to work on that. But middling it ain't an issue. And damn, that's nice. That's that's nice. Just Andy, know you'll go out and hit it off the center of the face every time. And he has one of the most legendary bag men of all time. Donald Cooper, otherwise known as Coop. Just an absolute beautiful man. You would love him if you ever get a chance to spend Let's get him on. Coop. Let's get on Coop. He is fantastic. But really got to thank Lucas Glover for taking the time out fun. and joining us. It was a lot of fun, Sleaze. And now it is time to get to the gambling segment, which I know money. everybody Let's make some money. is waiting on. And we got to tell you about FanDuel. Sleaze, while watching golf, I love adding to my sports watching experience by betting on all the action on FanDuel Sportsbook. There's a reason why FanDuel is number one. There's many reasons, actually. Their app is very simple to use. Great odds. Different betting markets, whatever you want. What do you like about it? Well, A, it's easy to use for a guy like <laughs> me that normally one, yeah. puts things off to the last minute. I can slide in and out of there and get a bet right before kickoff, right before tip, whatever it is. Also, love the fact that you can you get paid quickly. If you win some money, which is hard to do out there, they pay you. You don't got to drag this thing out for over and over like a lot of these different books out there. You got some different boosts you can put on the thing. If you're a guy that likes huge upside, I mean, you can bet really small, work in some of these exclusive same gay parlay features that you can bet, bet a little bit, win a ton. Love same that game deal. parlay is incredible. It makes that game really, wow. really fun to watch. Really fun to watch. And if you're an advanced degenerate, like a lot of us are, I mean, you got you got player props, futures, find whatever bet you're looking for. And the live betting feature is one of the best. If you see something on TV, you're like, oh, I sense Uncle Mo shifting right now. I want to get in and tap that. You can get those live bets. Just chase, baby. Fast. Chase Just all game always long. Always chase, and it'll eventually catch up. I love it so much. And right now, FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place your first bet on anything, and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win. If you've never... Tried FanDuel Sportsbook? What are you waiting for? Go to FanDuel.com slash subpar or download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started. Be sure to sign up with promo code subpar so they know that we sent you. Must be 21 years and older and present in New Jersey. New users only. $5 first deposit required. Must wager in designated offer market. Max bet $5. Bonus is issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full t- terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, Sleaze, let's get to it. Let's make our picks for FanDuel this week. We've got the Tour Championship at Eastlake. It all comes down to this. We the got grand finale. The, gra- the granddaddy of them all. That's right. All right. The and Pasadena we've got- of Atlanta. That's what they call Eastlake. It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, all right. We- really cool golf course. Old school. Yeah. Can't really blow it all over the place. I love that. Narrow, deep Bermuda rough that gives these guys all kinds of problems. But it's going to start out with Patrick Cantlay with a little two-shot lead over Tony Finau, three-shot lead over Bryson DeChambeau, four-shot lead over the co-tournament favorite, John Rahm. Start four back, be the co-tournament favorite. That's when you know the world thinks you're pretty damn good. Four back, yeah, I still like him to win it. Yep, at FanDuel, him and Patrick Cantlay, John Rahm and Patrick Cantlay are both plus 360, which... Wow, I mean, you're, you're spotting Patrick Cantley four shots. Dude. He just shot 27 unge. Ugh, not terrible. That's a rolling that's, it that's a bit. That's tough for me, but but Patrick hasn't had the best track record around Eastlake. I believe his last three times out there has not cracked the top 20. That is correct. So not not his favorite spot, at least in terms of results in the past. Well, if he puts it the way he did around Caves Valley, I think he's going to be just fine. He can slap it around that joint. But we're looking for value like here. We want to make some money, and when you got a guy that's playing as well as Tony Finau is right now, starting just two shots back. He's in that last group. He's going to be looking Patrick Cantlay right in the eyes, and he's plus 650. I know we both really, really like that one. That's both of our guy this week. We're going to go with Tony Finau starting two back. I mean, he's made this putter change. He just won at Liberty National, finally got that monkey off of his back, doesn't have to answer those questions anymore. And if you like a trend going into Eastlake, 63 final round on Sunday this past week. I mean, the guy is playing golf. I think he just feels free right now. I feel like he's 
just felt like he had shackles on him for a while and just couldn't get the job done, couldn't get it done, and then finally does. And I love him this week. I, and he putted well again this week. It wasn't like Liberty National was a one-off fluke. He putted well again this past week um, as well. So maybe there's something there. If he gets that putter figured out, I mean, that's really the only thing that's been holding him back from winning a bunch over he, the years. And he should be playing very free right now. I mean, he finished seventh on the Ryder Cup standings, which he's not an automatic qualifier. He's, in. he's on the team, guys. He's going to be wearing the red, white, and blue, and he's going to have a chance to win $15 million dollars come Sunday, starting just two shots back. Love him at plus 650. You know, a dark horse, he's a long ways back, but there's nobody that plays Eastlake better than Xander Shoffley. You can get him at plus 2,600 on FanDuel, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if something crazy happens. He goes out there and just torches the place. We mentioned he shot the lowest score yeah. last year. Seems to do it a lot just around was here. too far back of Dustin Johnson to catch him. Eight's a long ways back, but if I'm looking for a dark horse, I like Xander Schauffele right now. If he here. could just go out round one and pick off something, you know, if he could shoot a mid-60s and just make up some ground, then all of a sudden it becomes real again. But, I mean, he, who are you going to bet on other straight up other than Xander Schauffele around East? Like, he's been a beast. I'm looking at some value uh, around the same around the same line as you. I'm looking at 22 to one. A guy that's been playing some really good golf lately rolls his rock, chips his rock, wedges it like a beast. Cam Smith is sitting there at 22 to one. He's going to start off five shots back. So I mean, everybody's got their work cut out for him. If Patrick Cantlay goes out there and rolls it like he did last week, this thing might be bedtime. But like I said, don't have the best track record. And Cam Cam can shoot some low digits. Just shot a little 60 burger. Not too long ago, so the boy can go low, and uh, I, I like that bet if you're looking for a little bit of a value a little further down the and look, road. I mean, these these leads can go away pretty quickly. Quick. I mean, we say Xander Shoffley starting eight back, but like you said, he goes out and shoots 65 to maybe a 69 from Cantley. All right, we just cut it in half right there as long as somebody else doesn't do anything crazy. So you never know. It's going to be very, very exciting to watch. But look, at the end of the week, someone is going to be $15 million richer. I'm rich, bitch. That's oh, going to be the victory speech. That'll be, be the victory speech. Drop the hey, how do you off. feel about the win this week? I'm rich, bitch. See ya. That would be fantastic. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us. Everyone enjoy the Tour Championship, and we'll talk to you on next week's Golf Subpar.